been an absolute delight to be part of the process. And I'm, I would say I'm even more convinced that this process has a role to play in Oroville as one of our next steps. For so many people, activists and academics alike, like this kind of participatory collective decision-making model that we're using in Orville with like general meetings and like focus groups and task forces was like the cutting edge of like radical political practice. And I was like, really, it is? <laughs> like, it sucks. <laughs> like the experience we're having of this in Oroville on the day to day is for so many people so frustrating so disappointing, so lacking in both like depth of content and like human connection. So I was like, how, how can this be the be all and end all? Um, and then realizing that, yeah, there were certain issues um, with this kind of participatory governance um, that's practiced, which is like very open, very horizontal, you know, big meetings where anyone can come and speak. Um, but there were some issues that also in other places were being raised, like, hey, you know, it's only it's often um, just the people who are really comfortable in those settings that come. Um, so people who are very comfortable speaking in, in large groups, very comfortable fronting their um, opinion, and not, really not so inclusive actually to people who are more uh, introverted or just, yeah, just not interested in speaking in that, in that kind of large context. One of the things that had been really difficult around decision making was the um, either the disengagement of large sections of the community or the sort of um, seeming vying for power that seemed to happen around a selection to major working groups which seemed to have decision-making power. Imagine if instead we bring together ordinary people from all walks of life. These people are selected randomly like a jury, so they're impartial and representative. This um, idea of just randomly selecting residents or citizens felt really like it would bypass a lot of this sort of unequal distribution of decision-making power and just make it more, yeah, just distribute it much more into the community um, and give everyone a fair chance to have a seat at the table. So that I found was really exciting and interesting. Village Algol in the Medak district of the South Indian state of Andhra Pradesh was the host to a unique event called Praja Tirpu, People's Verdict. And again, it was really obvious to me at least that, that we are really blocked in Oroville in terms of how we come to agreement on important topics and we either tend to do that superficially um, in a hurry or certain people have a kind of disproportionate amount of say in the way things go. So I love the idea of also including this deliberative process and facilitation as well, which I think could really enhance the quality of outcomes. They're made aware of critical thinking to complement their natural common sense. They have opportunity to shape the process and the agenda. They talk to experts, they talk and listen to each other. When they finish, they decide what the best way forward is and instruct the government to act. It's about fairness. Decisions made to benefit everyone, not just the powerful. And I also found it really exciting, the potential to have a sort of learning process for participants as well, that it could potentially um, improve our capacity as a collective to talk together and think together about important topics and, um, and engage in a non-divisive um, and conflictual way on topics where maybe there would normally be sort of a lot of difference and diversity, but to have a space and a structure and a kind of facilitative process through which um, we could engage all of that without having to leave anything out. So there was just so many elements that I found were really beautiful and really felt inspired and felt really aligned to the kind of values that I think Oroville is really about. I hadn't heard much about Citizens' Assembly before, but one of the first tasks after we met the first time with Cathy and the small team was to look at what had happened elsewhere what had worked, what hadn't worked. So I started to do some research on that for the team. The model's generally been a success elsewhere. It's generally been chosen to look at issues that are uh, too difficult for those who are governing to 
explore that in Ireland the uh, issue around abortion was too contentious because there's a lot of sensitivity around religious issues there so some of the politicians wouldn't want to be seen taking sides on that debate and then in some of the other countries especially I think it was in Belgium and also in Canada they did it to look at the governance system so again it wasn't felt that the government should be looking at that themselves so they asked for a wider one and then in Gdansk they used it to look at sort of bigger issues such as climate change and flooding and that one set up slightly differently its recommendations actually go straight into policy whereas normally they're a sort of the outcomes inform policy. So it's really interesting to see the different structures and the different way it's being applied. They have honest conversations and find common ground on the actions we need to take. This is an approach known as a citizen's assembly and it's gaining popularity all around the world as a way to solve tough problems that politicians can't. To tackle the emergency, only ordinary people like us can guide the extraordinary change needed. There was quite a lot of information as an alternative form of democracy, so that was quite interesting to me because I'm not very impressed by our present efforts at democracy, either in Oroville or elsewhere. And I was very interested by the random aspect, particularly that, I think. But the idea you bring together people of very different backgrounds, um, who wouldn't normally actually sit together and talk to come up with some kind of conclusion. I found it very interesting and actually quite challenging as a concept. And I have a kind of elitist assumption, um, which is that to get intelligent outcomes, you need people who are experts in a certain field or have expertise in discourse or discussions or whatever. And that if you just bring together randomly people, uh, then you're likely to get something that's really not optimal. So that was the challenge for me in terms of the knowledge aspect of the experiment. Um, and having watched a few videos, it, I was quite impressed actually by the quality of the deliberations and also by the output at the very end of it. And when I heard it, there was something that sparked inside that felt like this could be a game changer for uh, our collective decision making. That there was something in it that felt very true and, and uh, there was a lot of potential. And I was ready to jump in and explore it. There's a difference between what we had to do running a pilot and what you would do if it was an integral part of the Auroville decision-making system. With the pilot, we reached out to the community for ideas as to what the topic should be. And we needed a topic which was interesting enough to keep people's attention, not crazily complicated, and certainly not anything which was divisive that people would immediately start arguing about, because we need to try and show proof of concept uh, to the community of how this can work before we start to take on more difficult issues. So water clearly emerged as the most suggested and needed topic. Um, well, water is uh, a big challenge here. So we have an issue of water scarcity here in this region. So the water tables are going down, um, mainly due to like over extraction in our general area but also due to climate change because the rainwater, the rainfall patterns are becoming more and more unpredictable. So we don't know when we're going to receive rain, how much. And this is, the rain is what recharges the groundwater. So it's very important um, for our general water security. And because of both these factors, climate change and this huge growth that we're experiencing, uh, water is becoming more and more of an issue. The spaces in like sustainability that my research kind of addresses are saying that, you know, we need more of these kind of citizens initiatives to take decisions. Of course, consulting with the experts, but that the, the decision-making power is kind of taken to the citizens. So that's what inspired me. So there was about a three, four month period where we were just kind of pulling all the pieces together. So that included, yeah, 
forming a core team, working through the logistics of sortition and how we would actually do that in Oroville. Um, working on how we would select a topic and actually selecting a topic, presenting it to the community, which we felt was really important to get sort of a widespread understanding and buy-in, especially when we were asking random people to participate. It, like it felt really important that enough people in the community understood what it was about and what it could offer. So then once that was clear, we took the master list, um, made sure it was up to date, we used an algorithm to shuffle the names at random, and then we simply took the first 150 names from the master list and basically approached, as much as possible, approached every person face-to-face -to, -face to explain the situation, to explain what we're trying to do and ask if they'd be interested. And the aim was to roughly get about 30 participants. It would be possible in the future for a lot more. And we got such a great range in terms of ages, definitely. Um, we had someone who was 18 and then the oldest were definitely over 70. We also had a, a range of nationalities, although that's something that I think needs to be explored, why some particular groups dropped out more and why some were overrepresented. Uh, even when you pick randomly, it becomes self-selecting slightly in the people who say yes and no. But again, we'd hope to explore that a little bit and also hope to um, that once people understand the model a bit more, they're more willing to participate. The other experiment which really maybe interested me most of all was the social experiment. Bringing together people, Oravillians from very diverse backgrounds, educational, cultural, and seeing how they kind of interacted together. I found on the whole very successful. It, it, it made me realize to what extent I tend to be with people I feel comfortable with in Oroville. I mean, that's my circle of friends and acquaintances. And they tend to come from a similar background, similar education or whatever. So I was really interested to see what happens uh, when you bring together people from very different backgrounds. Some of these people had never attended a meeting in their life before. And some of them had much less education than others. And I think in the process of being part of this citizens' assembly and having the space within it to express themselves. They all managed to find a space where they could really be themselves and express themselves and were grateful for that. We'd run one session before lockdown hit and then everything was on hold. And it was only then as lockdown started to ease and we were thinking, okay, how can we restart within lockdown parameters and guidelines? And it was very clear that we wanted to make adjustments in a direction which would improve what we were doing. There felt like a certain um, way in which it would need to happen in order to um, be a legitimate citizens' assembly, you know, um, the key elements being, you know, the presenting of evidence, the ability for participants to interact with those presenters and, um, you know, and then the deliberation. So we, re when we realised that we would only be able to convene in small groups, um, yeah, there was then this idea to look at a different way of doing it and that was how the idea of video presenters came along. I think we quite realised that it had not only certain merits but maybe even certain advantages to be able to bring more presenters together around a thematic um, in a way that would be more efficient and maybe even take some of the heat off the presenters to be able to speak more freely and more um, directly through that process of interviews without having to deal with maybe questions at the time from the audience and then have some of those interactions with um, the panel at a later date. So overall we picked 30 experts and we really tried to, to get people working in all the different domains of water. So anyone working with water in Oroville who had a different um, side of the story and who brought different important aspects to the table were invited to take part. So before COVID, we were inviting the experts to come and give live presentations um, to the Citizens' Assembly. Um, and then COVID happened. <laughs> so that whole process was kind of cut short. 
And um, then when we regrouped, we had to find ways in which to make um, the whole process more COVID friendly. So we ended up making videos of uh, presentations by the experts and asking them all the same set of questions and just having that video interview format. Um, um, we roughly grouped them according to the themes. Like, for example, we had farms, then we had uh, different water management approaches. We had people focused on water quality, um, others on spiritual properties. Then we had governance and planning and education and awareness. With the film editing process, uh, most of us were fairly new to that. And we had a lot of concerns at the start about how can we make sure what we represent, if we cut the videos in any way, that it's going to be non-biased. So we did a few trials where all of us had a look at the original film and suggested our cuts. And then from that, we saw that there was a lot of consistency and we sort of came up with some very clear criteria on what we should edit in and what we should keep out. But we also shared the full interviews, uncut interviews with all the participants so they could see and learn from sort of the, um, the more detailed interviews. The moment we start to edit down somebody's interview, uh, we're making value judgments on what should go into the final video and should and, and will be left out of the video. So we tried to make sure amongst us that we're each, each time we did an edit, there were at least two peer reviews on that edit. I think what's very important is that the process that the random selection of people go through has to be as transparent as possible so that the rest of the community can very clearly see the information that was being used by the participants to come to the decisions or the, the guidelines. We really made an effort to try and be as inclusive as possible. So especially for the Tamil population, some of which didn't speak English so well, we, we made an extra effort to dub all the interviews and all the videos into Tamil. And yeah, maybe in future citizens' assemblies, there'll be translations into you know even more languages. <laughs> for the translation, it's huge amounts of work, but it inspired a whole community of people to come forward. To, to really contribute towards the various aspects of making the content happen, whether it was the dubbing, the translation, the transcription, the subtitling. I mean, we worked with over 50 people who just on that, who really gave their time and heart out of goodwill. So I learned that in the community, when there is a need, there is a huge potential um, of creating communities of support for this kind of process. I think the videos um, for this first uh, pilot somehow it, it emerged out of necessity through the lockdown, through the COVID, through the, the need to, to keep the numbers in the rooms low. But actually it's proved to be one of the most valuable treasures I feel for, for us um, because the videos really showed how content could be um, framed uh, for participants. So a key part of the Citizens' Assembly is to provide different voices on a particular topic. Um, all sides, all stakeholders. And so having these videos, um, really for us, it created um, the heart around which we could do the rest of the, um, yeah, the Citizens' Assembly um, pilot, you know. So it's a rich resource for not only the Citizens' Assembly itself, but also for the wider Oroville um, for the future. It's nice that everybody is close, so it's easier physically for people to come together. It's also different because people generally seem to know each other as well. Many people have lived here for decades uh, and interacted on many levels, so you don't have the same flavour with other citizens' assemblies where they're sort of totally random people who've never met each other before coming together. So for us, I think that's why focusing on bias was a really important and critical aspect of the first session because people come with preconceptions not only on the speakers who they will know some of them but also on the other participants so we really wanted to try and create something that allowed the neutral discussion to happen and in the ca model um, you know they take that into account and really learning about about bias and how we do hold these assumptions and prejudices 
and not at all in a judgmental way, just acknowledging that this is human nature, this is the human brain. So how can we be really conscious and intelligent about that and really front that and then start conversations from, from there? It, it felt like a quite a neutral, open atmosphere with nobody really pushing any certain agenda. And to be able to look at these issues with a very open mind and uh, without kind of opposition, without strong opposition even between participants. So that felt, that felt like a success. One of the things that we were trying to explore with this research pilot was how willing people were to give up their time for a process like this. And it was a real unknown to us. Some of the citizens' assemblies just have uh, sort of two weekends and some of them go over a whole year. And we didn't really know where that balance was to get the information. So we settled on, um, it was sort of nine half day sessions and with a few optional ones. And we still felt this would be quite a stretch. It's quite a commitment over sort of two or three months of time, giving up a lot of Saturdays to come along and participate in this. Uh, so we felt that we really needed to make the sessions enjoyable for people to keep participating. It was quite mental, what we're asking them to do, a lot of thinking, so we mixed it up with sort of exercises. We had quite a lot of dancing happening and other um, energizers and also some opportunities to, uh, for inner reflection as well. So we try to engage people on different levels and that's probably something that doesn't happen in other citizens' assemblies as much. And we had a lot of fun in the organising. <laughs> I think it's a whole citizens' assembly as well. I think when you see older Oregonians dancing to the Beach Boys or uh, making animal noises for 10 minutes, uh, we realise that actually, you know, we, we, uh, <laughs> we limit ourselves in terms of how we look at each other. And again, it was just a, I think, a demonstration of the commitment that people, people were just willing to try anything. They, they felt it was worth trying and they were going to give their everything to this experiment, whatever it took. Almost everybody said they would be willing to do this again um, because they felt it was a really positive experience. Um, almost everybody said that they really felt the Citizens' Assembly model could be useful here in Orville, either in its full form or definitely drawing elements from it. Um, some specific elements that people highlighted were um, the random selection. So people actually really appreciated this aspect. Well, the outcome was in two parts. So it was vision and as we were discussing different potential aspects of the vision for water for Oroville, it was also very clear to the participants that actually implementation was as important, if not more important, than vision. How we harvested um, the ideas for vision and implementation, it sort of built on each other. So it didn't need that uh, the attendance had to be 100% for it to feel like the decision um, had some weight. It really people added as the weeks went along and in the final vision and implementation days uh, we really looked at all of those ideas that we harvested and then from that um, something more collective emerged. I think really it's been very impressive indeed what they've come up with in terms of vision and implementation. I can't imagine off the top of my head that the so-called experts would have done any better. This will be the third vision that the water group have had over the years. I think it's by far the best. I think the water players will, will be touched and will be inspired by the vision. I mean, I'm inspired by the, by the water vision that has come out of it. It's kind of at a different level, um, focusing more on the ideals, you know, on what you know, our society could look like, um, rather than what the water management could look like. So that, that's a really different perspective that it brings to the table. So there's still a little bit of follow-up work on this uh, first Citizens' Assembly. We uh, will be taking over the next few weeks the outcomes to the water players to see um, how they feel about what's emerged and which aspects they can work to take forward. And then we'll also be having some form of uh, celebration with the community. That was something that came up very clearly 
from the assembly members that this should be something that we come together and enjoy and celebrate um, around water and around the vision as well. So it's not just something they want to see on words, sort of just put up on or a net or on some sort of policy. They actually want to see this somehow make its way into people's hearts. And then there'll be a wider discussion on uh, what next for Citizens' Assembly. So sharing the learnings about what's worked and what hasn't from the process side and which aspects could be included or whether there's a feeling of doing another one. Where does the Citizens' Assembly end? Formally, it's ended now, of course, in terms of the participants are no longer formal participants in the Citizens' Assembly. But then we have this whole uh, taking forward the, implement the proposals and the visions. And I don't see that just being the responsibility of the organizing group. I would like very much that some of the participants take that on, if they're willing to do it. It was also um, really quite a harmonious team experience, um, which was really nice. Um, both efficient uh, and just, yeah, a, a good kind of human connection level, not any heavy dynamics internally. And I think that, I think that reflected in the process, actually, because one thing that we saw in the evaluations was, um, was that that was noted by the participants as they felt that from the team there was this real cohesion and positivity and lightness that was really motivating and, and encouraging. I also appreciated that we were quite a diverse team in the sense that there were uh, people that had been Orvillian for a really long time and there were newcomers as well, um, people that grew up here like myself. So it was, it was really nice to see all of those elements um, together. And I think that also as a relatively young person still uh, in Oroville, it was really nice to feel really supported and empowered um, within that team. I think the team worked very well as a group. I think I didn't sense any hierarchy or ego issues at all. I think everybody had some kind of input and something important to say at different times. And it was actually one of my most positive group experiences in Oroville so far. <laughs> I was very impressed by the professionalism, particularly the younger members, both in terms of how they constructed the programs for each session and also the facilitation, which I thought was really very impressive indeed. Something happened very naturally in this organizing team, which was the younger people took the lead from the beginning and it was absolutely natural and us older and dinosauric members of the community were extremely happy to support them because they were just so good. So that was a very nice experience. Of it. Yeah, I think there's been naturally emerging leadership as well, and I find it, yeah, that's been also really delightful to see. I'm so happy to see so many, in a way, younger women taking a leadership role, and that that's been not only not challenged, but welcomed and supported. It's been my the most positive group experience I've had in all of it. It was a delight. I was always looking forward to going to the meetings, and there were always smiles when everybody was leaving at the end. And for me, that is a sure sign we're doing something right. A small example of the collective wisdom happening within the core team, which filtered out to the participants. And actually one of the participants shared something very beautiful at the end when we, when we had the checkout round. I think it was in, probably in the agenda where the mother had written something about a council of wise people for Oroville at some point. What he was saying was that he had the feeling that the process that we had created and the space that we'd nurtured for the process. Actually, in that moment, the participants became those wise people, um, which really touched me. It, it's kind of, if we, if we can create space that everybody has the chance to be that wise person with other wise people in that moment, um, then I think we're really into something. would change going forward the structure. So this time we had uh, sort of the assembly meeting on consecutive weekends. So there wasn't a break if we needed to actually do something or reflect on something. 
And in a few places, Assembly members said, oh, they would have liked the opportunity to explore something in a little bit more in depth between sessions. So I think that ideally it would be good to have them uh, fortnightly, and then it gives that ability if something emerges or some extra input is needed to actually respond to that as you're going along. And it's also a little bit less tiring for participants and for the uh, organizing team as well. We, we, we talk about trying to Aurevillianize the citizens' assembly. So it's for me, it's a mini, a mini RA, a mini residence assembly, actually. So we need to find a good name for it. We need to sort of tweak it. As with jury duty in some countries in the world, where if there is a court case and a jury is required, certain countries have it that if or any citizen can be randomly selected for a jury and they are actually obliged to, to, to take part. Their workplace is then basically has to pay for the person to be on jury duty. So in that way, I would kind of, I would like to see if we, if it does get integrated, that we do something along those lines, that we don't have to hold citizens' assembly on weekends and expect people to take some of their very limited free time. I suppose we were a bit constrained by COVID in this round, but I think in the next Citizens' Assembly, I would encourage even more interaction between the participants and the experts. If we go the same route, which is videos, which I thought were very impressive and well done, Ideally, I would have, when a video is shown, I would have the presenters being in the room so they could immediately answer questions from the participants. There was a panel discussion later where some of the presenters actually answered questions, but it meant that some people had to hold, hold back questions for seven eight, or eight weeks. What I learned or really appreciated is that we can actually have a really harmonious collective decision-making process in Oroville. Yeah, and I think that the whole process itself, that it maybe builds trust among community participants, that they realise that it is possible to engage on difficult and potentially controversial topics in a way that doesn't have to devolve into fractious um, fighting, but that we can actually you know, use these tools, the communication tools that were offered as a sort of process guidelines to the group. Orville is about, I mean, it's one of its ideals is this human unity in diversity. So this directly addresses that, you know, you have a diverse group of people coming together and kind of exploring a topic in some depth and then having to kind of, you know, process it and come together so I think this fits perfectly into the ideals of Oroville and is exactly what we need. This format of random selection of uh, small groups, of looking at the learning aspect of going through the whole topic, not just being presented with something and then needing to be to, to, to make a decision. I think they're all something that Oroville really desperately needs at this time, especially as we are increasingly polarized, as we increasingly don't really know what are the, the facts, and this is reflecting, of course, the wider world. Um, I feel for us as a community, there is a deep intelligence um, that's both from us, but also from, from beyond us, you know, and having a structure and a format that is adaptive, that also has a particular way of working, I think there's a real potential to tap into that. So I was also part of the, the initiative in March and already I could see such a great structure and the fact that the team has put so much time and energy to learn, adapt and now we have in fact I think a much better structure. But this kind of structure is really bringing conclusion and bringing out facts and figures and trying to take the personality out of the topic. So for me, it's an amazing learning experience. It reflected also no, in the energy that, that we share when we were there. So I couldn't imagine a better experience. From the organizer's side, maximum votes, really. Commitment, patience, engagement, quality, super. What I didn't know was all the layer, all the 
part that is connected with Tamil Nadu, not only Auroville. So for me, it was like a big opening. This anybody can do. And like a jury in a court, you know, like you feel really responsible. But for me, I felt maybe the site visit and all would, would help us to, to more, to understand more. It's calm, it's not, it's not in any way tense, you know, like I think, I mean, I've stopped going to conventional meetings in Oroville because, because uh, my hackles go up the minute I sense any form of vested interest or, or, uh, or hostility. It created a, a safe space. It was highly, well, very well organized, making fun, at the same time very focused. I am very positive and supporting of the continuation of these activities. And uh, I hope it is well received and actually do something about uh, the water situation in Oroville. If we can do something here that's an example for the rest of India, that would be, that would be my hope, that we can uh, start something that has much larger impact.